Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Miracle Voices. I'm here with my co-host, Tam Morgan. Tam, how's it going today? It's going great today. Finally got on. Um, Good. How are you, Matt? I'm doing well. Yay. Peachy. Great. And we have a guest today, Maggie Fitzsimmons. Maggie, welcome. How are you doing? I am doing great. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to both of you. Maggie, where are you sitting in the world right now? I am in Oswego, New York, which sits right on Lake Ontario in upstate New York. Great. Right on the border with Canada? I went camping there once. Oh, nice. My sister-in-law was from there. Oh, yeah. It's a good place. Is there moose there, Maggie? No moose. No no moose here. Oh, well, I just want to say that we went to Idaho this weekend for my partner's to see my partner's daughter. And we were on a river raft and suddenly we turned a corner and we were 10 feet from an enormous moose. Oh, and lucky. we were way more startled than the moose because it's obviously used to people coming in rafts near it, but <laughs> it was really startling. <laughs> was it a full grown, like mature oh, moose? Oh, very, very, They're full, enormous. very mature, more mature than I was. <laughs> yeah anyway well maggie we're absolutely delighted that you're here maybe you can tell us yeah. how a course in miracles came into your life yeah sure and in order to tell that story i will um include a little bit of information about how it came into my husband's life just because that is actually how it came to me okay um a little bit of his story but uh i've been given permission by oh, him good. to Shout out to Joe. Shout out Shout to Joe. Shout out to my husband, Joe. Yes. So I think like a lot of the guests that you've had on this podcast, I really felt like from a very young age, I was on some sort of pursuit. I just had a sense that this is not it. This life, this world, this just doesn't seem like this is right. And as long as I can remember, I was reading and trying to figure out what else could possibly be going on here. Is there any kinds of answers that actually make sense? So I was reading from a very young age, a lot of different philosophy. And I mean, when I was quite young, I I remember reading Greek mythology. Uh, I got into religion and spiritualities as I got a little bit older. And then when I went to college, I was taking basically as many philosophy courses as I could take without actually declaring it my major only because I was told, don't major in philosophy, there's nothing to do with it. But I was enjoying it so much more than any of my other coursework. And I really just had this sense that I wasn't finding my answers anywhere. Everything I read, everything I looked at, I get little pieces of things. I get little pieces here and there, that feels nice, that feels right. And I kind of gather those little pieces, but it always just kind of felt like each thought system, each philosophy or theory that I came upon. It just felt like there's little holes, little places where I couldn't quite make sense of it or it didn't quite feel right. And so when I was in college, um, my pursuit had continued to include reading and perusing just about any text I could get my hands on that seemed to be asking kind of big questions like, who are we and what are we doing here? But had also started to branch out into including like experimentation and drug use um, because I had had some experiences like I think many college students do. But I had had very what I consider spiritual experiences. So it had started to include um, talking to others and just really letting my mind be open. And um, when I was 20 years old. I just had such a strong sense that 
I'm not meant to be in college right now. This is not really, I'm not putting my heart into this. I mean, I was still doing well. I was always a very good student um, and I was still pulling it off, but I just really didn't feel invested in it. And I don't like to do things that I don't feel invested in. It's a big thing about my personality. So I'm either in it and I'm fully in it or I'm just out. And so at 20, I just really felt strongly I'm out. This college experience is just not speaking to me right now. I do want to learn, but it's not what they're teaching me. And so I dropped out of school and it was a really big shock to everyone around me, kind of even a little bit to myself. It's like I look back on it now and I recognize it was so guided, but I didn't have that language or any kind of way to think of it like that then. But I dropped out of school and I came back to my hometown and my hometown happens to be where my husband is from as well. We actually are exactly the same age and graduated high school the same year, but we never knew each other when we were in high school. Oddly enough, though, we did have the same friends. We had some friends in common and we've put together over the years times where I was actually being told something about him from somebody else. I just didn't know who he was at the time. But when I dropped out at 20, he was having his own parallel experience at college and he simultaneously dropped out at age 20. He, however, had found some answers that really made a lot of sense to him before he actually made that choice. His answers made him drop out, whereas I was like, I haven't found my answers yet and I'm dropping out to find them. So when I was um, back home that first summer, I decided I wasn't going back to college. And this was not really something that was agreed with or supported by my friends and family, just out of love and care for me. They just weren't really sure what I was doing. I couldn't really articulate well to them what I was doing. So I understand their concern. But I was staying with friends and um, my path and Joe's path crossed. The same people that we had known and been um, kind of almost interacting with each other through high school via um, happened to be back in our hometown and we reconnected because our circles finally overlapped. And the first time I had a conversation with Joe, he handed me Gary Renard's book, Disappearance of the Universe, because he had found that book and that is what had caused him to drop out of college. And the reasons that this really spoke to me and I clung to it the way that I did from that age, um, connect to my forgiveness story. So I know I'll be talking more about this in a little bit, but I would just want to also say that the bit of Joe's story that he was okay with me sharing, that's just so interesting is that he had found disappearance of the universe because he was, like I said, having a similar experience of really just feeling like school wasn't teaching him what he was trying to figure out and he had been doing his own pursuit. We read many of the same books, actually. Um, and he had been driving to class one day, shortly before he dropped out of college. And he just decided while driving that he wasn't going to take the turn to take to the campus. And he just drove past campus. And he says that he doesn't really remember choosing that. He just found himself doing it. But he drove right to a bookstore, again, kind of not really feeling like he chose that, walked right into the bookstore, walked right up to a shelf, and Disappearance of the Universe was lit up on the shelf. And he grabbed it, read the back of the book, and it said something about Ascended Masters. And he had read some books just before that called Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East, which is a series of books I read as well before we met. And so he saw the words Ascended Masters and just thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe it's like the Masters I was just reading about. And so that's what made him purchase the book. But he shortly thereafter dropped out and that's when we met. And so when he and I were talking, he was so excited because I was the first person that was receptive to him talking about this information. (laughs) And he um, handed me that book. I took his copy home that first night that we talked. And um, it's just been in my life ever since then. I can definitely relate to to Joe here. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a receptive audience for what I've been going through. She's <laughs> she's into this. Okay. Yes, yes, definitely. How okay. amazing. What a tremendous way to come together with someone. Yeah, it's really just so interesting still looking back on it. We both mm-hmm. um had felt pulled for our own kind of reason, I guess, but then it just makes so much sense now. 
And when you said you started reading at a very young age, what age did you start reading about anything metaphysical? You know, Tam, I honestly couldn't even tell you. I think I commented that it's been as long as I can remember. My memories from my childhood are a bit spotty, um, kind of also connects to my forgiveness story, but I don't recall an age. I would say that I was always reading in grade school, like, you know, above my level and reading books that um, my teachers would say, oh, usually people read that in middle school. (laughs) Usually that'll be a book you probably get recommended to read later. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, the Greek mythology was the earliest thing I remember being into. And I think I was quite young. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so you and Joe bonded over disappearance of the universe. And what, what happened next or after that? Yeah. So we bonded over that um, conversation and, you know, when he handed me the book and was talking to me about it, um, it was something that I immediately just was drawn to and and almost like bound to um, because of an experience that I had had actually prior to meeting Joe. Um, So it was something that immediately just was a very big part of my world. And he too, just immediately felt like in my mind, I thought clearly this man is like, I want to be with this man because he brought me the answers I've been looking for all of these years. He found them. And not only did he find them, but he was able to recognize it. He recognized it for what it was. And so I just felt kind of bound to him and to um, the course from such a young age. We were 20 years old. And did you start practicing the course together? Yes, Doing we did. Book and reading the text or? So did- we didn't, we've never done anything like do the workbook together. Um, and actually, we've never, either one of us, done anything really in terms of doing like a study group with others. It was something that I'm, I'm 38 now, so it's been 18 years since this was brought into my life by Joe. And um, just over the past two years, I just began talking to people other than Joe about A Course in Miracles. Hmm. So we spent 16 years-ish just talking about it between the two of us. I mean, we did once go and meet Gary. We went to a workshop with Gary back in 2013. And so we met some other people there then, and we talked to them while we were there. But um, our, our, our practice is individual, but we do just love to talk about our practice together and support mm-hmm. each other in it. Wonderful. Which is probably a great, uh, segue to your forgiveness story, Maggie. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the forgiveness story that I would like to share is, um, actually one of self-forgiveness and it's something that I just feel really Um, guided to come onto the podcast and share with you all and anyone listening. Um, So in order to tell this story, I have to backtrack just a little bit from where we were just talking and tell a little story about the experience that I had shortly before meeting Joe that made this bond I'm talking about. So um, I mentioned that I was exploring in a lot of ways, trying to get my answers. I was reading a lot, but I was also um, exploring and experimenting with psychedelics. And so I had had um, so many, like I said, what I consider to be spiritual experiences. And it was something that even before I had that language to give it, it was just something very spiritual for me. Um, drugs coming into my life actually just gave me for the first time in my life, little feelings of peace and calm and connection. Um, But that was very complicated for me because (laughs) I grew up with uh, two parents who are probation officers and my family's uh, feelings on drug use are just pretty black and white. And I was always, like I said, such a good student and such like a a rule follower. So it it was a quite conflicted experience I was having with drugs felt very guilty and shameful about them. And I would hide that experience, but I knew I was having moments that were just so calm and peaceful and joyful that I couldn't not do it. So when I had dropped out um, of college and came back to my hometown, it was something that I 
was feeling very strongly about and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I just knew that I wanted to know what is going on here, really. That was the way it was really framed in my mind at that time. Like, what is really going on here? I want to know the inner workings. I want to understand what is this world? What am I? And as I was really, I guess, you know, I didn't think of myself as someone praying back then, but I see that now as my prayers. I was given an experience that um, came via a drug and it really did give me answers and explanation of what seems to be going on here. But it was something that um, was very kind of conflicted and complicated for me. So I had an experience where some friends invited me to partake in this drug that they were using called salvia. And it was something I was not familiar with. I'd never experienced before. Um, And I had a full out out of body experience with it, which none of my friends were were having at all. So that was also a bit odd. But what happened to me was something that I now recognize as a bit of revelation. It's how I think of it. And it's what it means to me. But it was so shocking to my system, out of context, and something that I am very grateful for now and I recognize has been a very important thing in my life, but was actually a bit traumatic and caused me to experience a lot of fear and anxiety and panic for a while afterwards. So, so you salvia, you inhaled that and mm-hmm. you, you went right out of body and what can you describe what that was like? Cause some of the detail of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really challenging to describe these types of experiences. I know that people can grasp that. And certainly anyone that's ever had these types of experiences can really relate. Um, But I have attempted to put it into words over the years just for myself. And um, also kind of always with this sense that um, this is part of my life. It's part of my story. and, And one day I feel like I might be telling it to somebody. So I have tried to put it into words over the years. It's something that really kind of is outside of anything that words can capture, but I will absolutely do the best that I can. So the first thing I want to say is that this whole experience was roughly 15 minutes, maybe even a little bit shorter. That was an approximation given to me by my friends after the fact. In my experience, it is completely just impossible to try to articulate how much time it seemed to be that I spent within it because it seemed to contain elements that were timeless. But I will say that it definitely seemed like longer than 15 minutes. So the first thing that happened was that um, almost immediately, I mean, before I even exhaled, I was starting to feel a feeling that I recognized I can't tell you anything more than that. (laughs) I don't know how to describe it. It just felt like a familiar feeling that -hmm. something in me immediately was like, oh, here's this thing. Like it was something I've experienced many times before. And I said that out loud, actually. I said, oh, here it comes. To which my friends were kind of like, here what comes? (laughs) But I was immediately gone. So I, I wasn't responding to them and interacting with them. I was sitting on the edge of a bed and I started to lean forward, they said. And immediately I leaned forward, leaned forward and just kept leaning. And I just fell right off the bed forward and hit my forehead on the floor. And they knew I was not in my body. Um, I immediately sat up though, and then was looking up at the ceiling. So they saw that I was alert And they kind of just kept an eye on me for the rest of the experience. I did not sense that I was in the room at all from the point that I said, here it comes and closed my eyes, started leaning forward. I was out of the room. I was out of my body. And right after the feeling that felt familiar, the next thing that happened was I had the very distinct feeling that I was waking up from a dream. And it was so clearly that kind of a feeling of when you're having a bad dream and you're stressed out and you're struggling and then you wake up and you go, oh, gosh, okay. Oh, that was nothing. That wasn't anything at all. It was like that, 
except it was my life. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, okay, that wasn't real at all. And I had this sense, almost a little bit embarrassed, a little ashamed of like, wow, how long was I looking at that? That really had my attention. I was lost in it. And then I had the sense that I was somehow stuck and connected to something. I don't know how to really articulate this well because I didn't feel like I was a body anymore, but I did still have this sense of me being a separate entity. And I had a sense that there were lots of other beings with me. I even at one point had the feeling just that everyone I had ever known was there and even people that I didn't know were there too. And that we were all connected. Like everybody was somehow connected to each other and everybody was okay with this except me. I'm struggling and I'm straining and I'm trying to pull away from it. And I just had this sense that somehow my struggle and my strain was complicating it. I don't know how else to explain that. And then I kind of quickly from there went into a period where I no longer felt struggling and strain. And I was seemingly above the world, like looking down on the world, but it looked like the world was made up of a bunch of little moving pieces, almost like I remember these connect oh, I don't even know what to call them. They're kind of like Legos when I was a kid, but they could be put together and you could make things that actually move. And it was like that. It was like everything was made up of these little Legos or these little connect pieces. Connector little... sets or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's familiar to anyone else listening, but yeah. kind of like Legos that can actually create little devices that move. And it was like the world was made up of all of these little pieces like that. And I was looking down at it, kind of floating above, very much not feeling a body at this point at all, like just consciousness. And I had the sense that there was a voice, like kind of like a warm parental voice explaining things to me. Now, that's weird to say it like that, because in reality, I don't have any memory of and actually hearing a voice. I don't have any memory of any specific words that were said or any explanations that were given to me. I just had this felt sense that something was giving me information, explaining basically the inner workings. So now I look back and I see, well, there's the answer to the prayer, Maggie, who kept asking what's going on here. I want to see it. And it felt like in that moment, I was getting the answer to that. And then from there, the experience went into the timeless part of it, which all of this feels a bit timeless, but this part is where it just really felt like revelation. It was just white, light, like you hear so many people say, and it's just really kind of not adequate to describe it, but it's the closest thing you can say. It felt like peaceful, just infinite, like expansive. Um, I was just, I was everything and I was nothing. And there's nothing outside of me. And I have no idea how long I was there. There's just no way. It seemed like just an instant, but also forever. It's just so hard to try to make sense of the time thing. And then it was like, I came back down through the layers of the experience. So then I was coming back through the kind of looking over everything viewpoint. And then I was back to the experience of feeling like I was stuck to things and I was uncomfortable. And then I started to realize I was in the room and I started to see my body again. And at that point, I was actually laying on the floor again. My friend said that I sat for a while looking up at the ceiling and they were talking to me and I wouldn't respond, but I was kind of moving my eyes around and looking around. And eventually I just laid back down on the floor. So when I came to, I was looking at my hand laying on the floor. And at first it was like, my body was almost part of the floor. It was like, I could see the wood grain in my hand. And then my hand kind of slowly raised up out of the floor and became flesh toned. And I looked up and I saw my friends and then I was, I was back and the experience was over. But the resulting trying to understand it by my ego was where it got, I think, really scary and then a bit traumatic for me. Mm. So the ego kind of chatterbox turned on, like, what was that? How do we explain it in relation to the individual Maggie figure? Exactly. And it 
of course, can't really comprehend that. And its way of comprehending that was very sad and scary. Um, It was already in my personality, a deep, deep feeling of being all alone. Like I said, um, just from whatever reasons, my, my childhood, I felt very alone. I felt very lonely and sad and I don't really remember a lot of it. Um, I always just felt that way though. And so my ego, as I came out of that experience, just was absolutely mad at me. Like, well, look at it now. I mean, you're more alone than you ever really understood. And now you can't unknow that too. So there you go. And it was like I'd done something wrong, like I had opened a door that I couldn't close and now you can't go back. And it was also this interpretation of it as if, yeah, Maggie Fitzsimmons is the only thing, right? Like, and that just was, I mean, it's been a thing that I've been undoing uh, ever since then. Wow. I find it, it, it's an amazing thing that, we have drugs that uh, I, I know out certainly out where we are, like ayahuasca has been something that so many people use and all sorts of drugs to bring us. Um, a lot of people aren't doing it for entertainment sake. They're doing it for, you know, a spiritual awakening. Um, and sometimes, uh, and, and people don't even call ayahuasca drug, they call it a medicine, but there's, so many times that I've heard of that people get a blast open and then their ego really does have to reorient and experience it. Whereas I rarely hear that with the course and meditation, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it, it almost like it it's slower and it brings you in, in deeper and deeper degrees that you can handle. Um, instead of this huge blast that is that can be so profound and remarkable, but the ego can come back in a bigger way in attack or trying to reorient that is a little bit more difficult mm-hmm. than as I've seen it doing it, you know, in a daily practice where it just starts to increase and increase and increase. So um can totally understand uh where the extremity of the situation brought your ego to a different place. And luckily you do have a a practice that anchors you in this. Now I am still wondering in this, where is the actual forgiveness story? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're getting there, but yeah, thank you, Tam. That's all so true. And it's, it's a big part of how I understand it now at this point, I think you were just using the language like blow open and it's like that it, it felt like um, something that just was too quick and it was, you know, I, I view it as something that was very important for me. And it, of course, wow. um, is something that has provided me with so many lessons and opportunities since then. But um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> to anyone else. And I've, I've said that to others before. I've had people ask me, um, I haven't told too many people this story, but when I have told it, um, I've said to people, I wouldn't, I would never, I would never suggest to somebody that they do it. Now, if someone does that and they're having a great experience and it is helpful to them, then wonderful. And of course, I would not want to take that from someone either, but I would never say you should do this because it produced so much fear for me for so many years and panic. I had panic attacks for years after this. And it was partially because my ego believed that at any moment that was going to happen. I was going to be ripped suddenly from the dream and that Mm -hmm. I was going to be kicking and screaming and it was going to be scary. One of the great comforts that did come to me, there's been so many layers of healing this (laughs) throughout the years. One of the comforts that came to me to kind of speak to that point, Tam, is in one of Gary's books. Um, I don't remember which one, but Art and Impersa, if anyone has not read Gary Renard's books, Art and Impersa are the Ascended Masters that um, 
were mentioned on the back of the book that made Joe interested in actually purchasing it. But Artin and Persis say in one of the books that some people have these types of experiences and it can traumatize them. And I felt when I read that, it was like a little healing for me in that moment, even too, just to go, yep, you just traumatized yourself a little bit there. It's okay though. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> well, the two things that you said that that kind of made me smile was one that you hadn't really spoken to many people about this, but you have now. <laughs> and, and two, the the sense of timelessness that you had, like you explained it was 15 minutes, but um, but so much, it was life-changing 15 minutes um, in that. And it, it reminds me of Narnia and, uh, you know, going through a wardrobe and a whole lifetime happening and then stepping back in to your other <laughs> life. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it it can be very, very disorienting. It was incredibly disorienting. And that's, you know, where the forgiveness story does come in. So just to connect this to what I was saying before about how the course came into my life, this incident occurred, um, I think, just a few weeks before Joe and I met. And I can't remember for sure because it was so long ago now. But it was definitely, I would say, within a month of us meeting and having our conversation. So what happened when I had the Selvia experience was that my personality did have some ability to understand some of it because I had been reading a lot, like I'd said, for many years. I definitely come across the concept of the world being a dream. I mean, it's a big concept in Hinduism and many other thought systems. So I had some concept for it, but there was still um, nothing had ever really fully explained that experience. So when Joe and I met and he started talking about things he'd read in Disappearance and was reading in A Course in Miracles, he handed me the book. It was like I had this moment of feeling a little bit of the feeling that I had felt that was the familiar feeling that I can't put to any words for anybody, unfortunately just enough of it to connect those moments for me. So it was like a two-parter almost of how it came into my life. It was like, here's an experience. And then here's a book that's going to explain it. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's how it was that it um, is something that I recognize now is such a gift in a lot of ways, because it did make it so that I just never felt any question at all if A Course in Miracles is speaking the truth to me. It just felt like this is my truth. But the parts of it that were traumatic and scary is where that like ego interpretation comes in and then where the self-forgiveness was necessary. So I said a little bit about it already. Um, there was that interpretation that I'm all alone. There is the interpretation that I've done something wrong. I've done something bad and now you can't undo it. And it's like my you know, with so many years of course study now under my belt, it's like, I look at those thoughts. I'm just like, wow, that's really at the root of it all, isn't it? <laughs> um, but those were the ego thoughts that I really walked out of that with, as well as just really a very challenging sense of how do I want to be in the world now? Like you were saying, Tam, it was like the immediate thing that happened was my friends started talking to me. What just happened? Where were you? my gosh, no one else was experiencing anything like that. So wow, tell us about it, Maggie. And my immediate feeling was, what do I do with these people? I mean, they're not real. Do I talk to them? Like, I don't know how to handle this. And it felt like um, for many, many years, I was, I was trying to just decide, well, what do I want to be in this world then given what I understand about it now? I never had the confusion that I shouldn't do anything. I know sometimes that happens for people. I didn't have that sense, but I just really, it took me a while to reorient, like you said, and feel like um, this is no longer a terrifying thing. So the self-forgiveness has really kind of come in pieces over the years. And before I was even really recognizing it and knowing to call it that, like I mentioned, reading in Gary's books, there was a little piece of undoing some fear and some feeling of like, oh, you did something bad. You did something wrong when I read that. And then throughout the years, I've done um, the workbook a number of times. One of the times that I did it, I was doing it with 
Um, so Ken Wapnick has a series of books called Journey Through the Workbook. And it's basically where each of the workbook lessons is then given along with some commentary and some teaching from Ken. And he brings in t- references from the text and different things that help explain the workbook lesson and just make sense of it. So roughly 10-ish years ago, I was doing the workbook with those books. Um, Ken's been one of my most influential teachers. Um, After Gary's introduction, I felt like um, Ken is where I then really learned um, how to practice the course. And when I was doing the journey through the workbook with his books, um, it was when I realized at some point, like, gosh, I could ask for help (laughs) with this fear. It's like, I'd been practicing for years, just like a good soldier marching forward, even though I'm scared. I can't deny this thing. I feel unable to deny its truth. And I don't feel really able to just pretend the world is a thing and just act in it like that. So I was marching forward doing my practice, but I felt terrified of what I was marching toward. I didn't have the feeling that some people describe of like, oh, God is so loving and peaceful and I'm so happy to be connecting. I was like, I'm scared, but I don't know what else to do. (laughs) So about 10-ish years ago was when I just finally made sense to me enough for me to realize I can ask for help with that. I can't ask for help with the fear like the Course says, but I can ask for help with the beliefs that are underlying and causing the fear. And so I started doing that. Ken talks to Jesus. And so back then I talked to Jesus. I've had different ways that I communicate with spirit, I guess, over the years. And at points, um, I really kind of communicate with Jesus more than with the Holy Spirit like I do now, but it's all the same thing. So I was asking Jesus if he would help me to please um, remove some of the fear from that experience so that I could have that revelation experience still, that knowledge, but be able to be less afraid of it. And I did get an answer to that. At one point, I dreamed about revelation and it was not scary at all. It was just beautiful and peaceful and so calm. And I recognized when I woke up right away, I remembered that it had happened and I recognized right away that it was the answer to that prayer. And I was just like so grateful for that then. But even with that, you know, that was roughly 10 years ago, there's still been um, a good deal of it. That really stopped the panic attacks. And I was not having the severe fear and anxiety anymore at that point. But I've just continued to still have pretty considerable anxiety and depression, sadness, lots of feelings of just always like being vigilant, (laughs) something that's about to happen, trying to prepare, trying to make sure I stave it off. And so I wanted to tell this story of self-forgiveness because I find it kind of comical now. I like to try to remember to laugh, right? I find it kind of comical now to look back at all of the years that I was practicing forgiveness and understanding the oneness, but still not really understanding self-forgiveness. I was letting myself say these mean things to myself about myself and feeling the anxiety, feeling the depression, feeling the feelings as a result. So what's happened over the past couple of years here, and this podcast has been a big part of this for me, which is part of why I wanted to tell this story here. I, I somehow, for some reason during the pandemic, started to wake up to the fact that I was missing a piece here and I'm really not forgiving. Um, there's some stuff that's running through my mind daily that I could be offering up and I'm, I'm not recognizing that I could be doing it. And I honestly don't even know that I could tell you exactly how that started coming through to me. It felt like I heard Judy and Matt in those early episodes and something in that started to speak to me in a way where I started to understand self-forgiveness more. And for a while there, Judy was more so the the kind of like voice I would hear (laughs) spirit coming through to me as like for years, I heard it as Ken, just because I listened to Ken for so long. But then I was hearing Judy for a while there, I think just because I was listening to the podcast so much. And so in these last couple of years, what's happened is my connection with spirit has just grown so significantly. And I recognize it's because of doing the self-forgiveness. It's been such a big opening in my practice. And it has really um, caused me to feel 
like my anxiety and depression are not gone. I will not say they're gone, but they are so considerably lessened. And my ability to just recognize what's going on when I feel those things and quickly just, nope, I'm going to just go ahead and, you know, choose again. That has just been life changing. So that's where the self forgiveness piece comes in. Yeah, you you really got the opportunity to you know in your out of body experience. It talks about that in the course that you we have this guilt that we screwed something up, and uh, like people are saying like I don't have any memory of that. Like I don't remember like Vincent doing any, doing anything, and you're like no, it's like right out of the body. I felt that. So, so you're, you're, you're asking for help and for like releasing that guilt and those shame feelings. And that's quite remarkable. I get all those answers and you you kind of took the rocket ship approach. Most of us are hoping for like a glider, but you got the like Elon Musk rocket ship to Mars. (laughs) I could see why it could be a little, or a lot disorienting. So really happy, happy that you shared that. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, very. And, you know, we we look at situations, um, well, I'll, I'll just say I do, um, and can't promote drugs, can't, you know, say don't use them either. We, we don't do that. It's just the discussion about it. But um, at times they, they can open the, they can make the shift from, reading about something to experiencing something and then going, "Uh Oh, (laughs) what did I really get myself into? So that you stayed with it, that you, it didn't make you run in another direction. Um, but you stayed with it, trying to get deeper and deeper to what is underlying, um, even, you know, the void, uh, which it sounds like some of this experience went into the void. And I know my mother had a, an extreme experience um, uh, in a dentist chair of that total loneliness and mm-hmm. the idea of coming back that that I haven't heard it said that way, but I really love what you said, like, should you even talk to these people um, <laughs> who, you know, who are your friends uh, in another view, like, the course's view, uh, they're just projections anyway. Uh, Mm -hmm. But they are here to help teach us what our own projections are when we're having difficulty. And so there, you know, I I may be an empty, you know, blob, but I am in relating with you a projection um, in that relationship of what good or bad things you see in me for you to do your self work. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you even want to entertain that you are alone in this universe, uh, that can be helpful. Uh, When you get to the other side of the void, or I should say kind of a flip experience that we're all one in everything, it's often a lot more enjoyable. Um, I think the truer practice is to get out of the duality and completely be okay with the contradiction of both um, (laughs) within it and be neutral and get to watch it from, from the place of who we really are, which is love. So in love, you know, there is the experience and form of everything and nothing, but you're grounded and anchored in the love to carry you through it in a very different way than the ego uh, understanding of it. Yes, yes, absolutely. I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes a lot of sense. And it's, um, you know, it's been a moving away from that, like fearful way of looking at others and, and thinking then, well, okay, well, they're not real. I don't, what am I supposed to do? How much is it stupid to talk to them? <laughs> am I being silly? Yeah. I'm deluding myself. Like, what, what am I doing? But it's like, okay, but really kind of failing then to recognize, well, well, Maggie's not real either. Maggie's as real as these people. So like, go ahead and interact with the people while you think you're Maggie. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So the loving way of seeing it is absolutely, I just like how you said that, Tam, like the love and letting there just be love 
in the seeming connections between the seemingly separate beings is absolutely where I feel myself in it now. And I've just really through all of this self-forgiveness and moving, you know, away from that fear and into this love that you're talking about, I think is I've allowed myself to actually have like spiritual community now. And in a couple different ways, I've really let myself have some different groups that I am interacting with that I speak very directly with about A Course in Miracles. And it's been so healing for me to feel able to do that and and, and recognize that in fact, um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be doing. So it's really feeling like that's been a big part of the self-forgiveness too, is to do, I think, exactly what you were saying there. Mm. I was thinking about that quote, the guiltless mind cannot suffer. And when you came out of that initial experience, you had a lot of suffering, perhaps still believing in the guilt part, like I'm guilty because I did something. And then you have that second uh, kind of experience in a dream, which was much more calming. And you, uh, maybe the guilt is the guilt. You realize the guilt's not real. Right. Right. And like you said, Matt, I think, you know, some people are not having like that. Some stories don't include having that direct of an awareness, right. Of that guilt and of that fear too. It's just, you know, my story includes me being very, very aware of that um, from a very young age. But um, the other thing that I wanted to say about what feels so different with the, with the self-forgiveness that I've been doing over the past couple of years is that I don't feel like that soldier just like marching towards something. You know, Tam, you said, wow, you know, you didn't turn away from it. You kept with it. It's like, but I kind of felt like I didn't have a choice. It was something that I felt stuck between two things that I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of being in this world and uh, how do I want to be in it and what is going on here? I don't really get it. Seems odd. <laughs> Can't pretend. But also <laughs> this was scary. I don't know if I want that. And I don't really feel like I have a choice though. It seems to be what's happening whether I want it or not. So it was like that soldiering on is just, um, I know I'm using that language a lot. It's really how it felt and what's feeling. I think one of the greatest gifts of what's happened over the past couple of years for me is that I don't feel like I'm soldiering on right now. It's feeling more and more like um, that experience that I'd hear others speak of and I wanted for myself, which is to feel actually peaceful and harmonious and to feel uh, like excited about being able to connect in that way. So that's been a really... Um, healing thing as well is just to feel like I am easing now. There's not a soldiering. There's not a marching. There's no trying to figure anything out. It's just really loosening up for me so much. And I'm just so, so relieved. Oh, so glad for that. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Light and breezy. <laughs> Ease and grace. <laughs> I say a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, Maggie, we'd like to, give listeners a sense of practical advice in terms of what you do when you get caught in that ego storm. It all seems real and we want to deny and project on others. And it's just anger and pain bodies everywhere. When you get in that situation, how do you get back to a grounded state? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the ego storm for me most commonly shows up as my anxiety and this sense that I need to figure something out, that there's not enough of something, often time, not enough time to get all the things done that need to be done. And I start to feel like I am in charge of something and I have to do things and I have to figure out what order and how will I get them done? That's <laughs> my most common ego storm experience mm -hmm. um, at this point in my life. And the way that I have been working on that Right, is really um, actually just kind of so sweet. Like I get these um, little, since I've been doing the self-forgiveness over the last couple of years, I feel like I have this very close connection with spirit now in which I get these little like personalized messages, these little personalized things that are helpful for me. Um, and I recently got from spirit like this little three-step 
uh, practice to, to have when I have the ego storm, basically. So I will share that with you right now. So for me, it's about um, sensing that I, getting confused about whether or not to do something, right? That kind of like I said earlier, some people really go hard into that, like the world's not real, so don't do anything at all. And I know that that's not the answer, but then I sometimes have a hard time, right, with finding that line of, well, I am going to do something, but not with my ego. So when I start to sense that I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm supposed to be figuring it out and I'm getting a little anxious and stressed, I've got a three-step thing. First thing is to express willingness to be guided to do something if there is something for me to do. So I don't need to try to scramble and figure it out. And I can even ask spirit to just make it very clear for me. So if there is something for me to do here, I am willing to do it. Please make it very clear. And then second is express willingness to understand the situation differently if that is helpful for me, if there's something for me to understand. Because that's another thing. Sometimes my brain, well, am I supposed to understand something here? Am I supposed to figure this out? Am I supposed to, what's the lesson? No, don't try to do that by yourself either. Just say, okay, I'm willing to understand something differently or see something differently if there is something for me to understand. And then third step is, if there's nothing for me to do or to understand, just express willingness to just trust that all is well. And that has been so healing for me. And the past, I think I just got that just a few months ago, I got that from Spirit. And that has been so helpful. It's been my go-to. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Very, right. very similar to the 12, 12 steps. The, will, the yeah, the willingness is a key theme in 12 steps. It's like if, if you're not willing, you can't be taught in 12 steps. And so the willingness theme comes up over and over again. So that's, that's beautiful. Mm, that's interesting. And in the course, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Good. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I, I was only going to say it felt to me almost like my own little serenity prayer. So it's just interesting that you are bringing in the 12 steps. Yeah. And also, I mean, like in the course, it says all we need is a little willingness. Um, and I love that. It's not wholehearted. You don't have to be wholehearted and in. Just the littlest bit of willingness goes a very long way because you'll be met. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Thank um, goodness. Well, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, Maggie, we have a tradition of asking guests what their favorite comfort food is and would love to hear what your favorite comfort food is. It's better if it's unhealthy. <laughs> yes. I'm familiar with this because I do. I listen, <laughs> I listen weekly. So I am ready with my answer and I ate my comfort food last night. Um, oh, okay. It's pizza. I oh, could eat pizza every day if it was healthy. <laughs> are you, a, are you a thin crust or thick crust person? Thin crust. I'm in New York. Yay. Yeah. No. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Being from Chicago, we have the thick crust, and it's really more of like a, a meat pie, really. It's a, but they're so dense, it's like a black hole of calories. It's true. It's, a whole, it's really a whole different creature. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I, I'm uh, with you on that, though. Pizza is great. Yeah. And every single, like now, there are so many different kinds, you know, from the the classic and the margarita to pesto to Hawaiian to, you know, it's just like, there's, you could have chocolate pizza. <laughs> you, you know, there's a subculture of people that are very upset. If you suggest you can put pineapple on pizza I like, know. and I'm like, this is the hill you want to die on is the pineapple <laughs> on the pizza. Well, I was going to say to you, that's what was on my pizza last night was ham and pineapple, but it's, <laughs> I was, I'm aware it's a very polarizing it pizza is. choice. It's <laughs> very, it's very <laughs> but I like it. I am one of those. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, thank, thanks to the WER web edition. I just wanted to double back for one second to give you a couple quotes about the little willingness, which is... Um, One is from the text, uh, your part is only to offer him a little willingness to let him remove all fear and hatred and to be forgiven. And really love that one. And the other one is, it is the same small willingness you need to have your whole relationship transformed to joy, the little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit for which he gives you everything, the very little on which salvation rests 
the tiny change of mind by which the crucifixion is changed to resurrection. Oh. Mm-hmm. Nice. Including those who really are into the pineapple on the pizza. That's right. <laughs> the little willingness to accept that could change anyone's entire being. I'm gonna we're gonna title this episode Forgiving Pineapple on the Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, I think you should title it the little willingness to a little forget. willingness? Yeah, ty- pineapple on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> If I can be forgiven for that, right? I yeah. can be exactly. for it all. <laughs> Maggie, how can people find you online? Yeah, so people would like to find my website online. It is at www.maggiefitzsimmons.com. Oh, Ma- well, thank you so much, Maggie. Yeah, Maggie. Thank- well, and th- also, Maggie... Well, thanks so much for coming and sharing your miracle voice, but also thank you so much for your help uh, with the YouTube and the Facebook and all the stuff you do behind the scenes that people don't know about that yes. you do. So thank you. Yes. And for the foundation for inner peace. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Yes. Yes. I'm very, very glad to be able to help out and volunteer in any way. So thank you for letting me. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.